Welcome to the climate trial. Glad you're here. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for braving this unseasonably nice weather to come out here today. Uh, there's a lot of people I recognize and a whole lot I don't. And it's wonderful. This isn't going to be a normal trial. We're not trying to replace the trial of Timothy Christopher. We're not trying to reenact what should happen in the courtroom necessarily. What we're doing is exposing the truth behind the situation. We're searching for justice. We're digging out what uh, should be should be known. And uh, we want to uh, make sure that we all participate because we're in this together. We're in this entire problem together. And that we answer the question that we set out to answer here today. And that is, who is really responsible for the climate crisis? And who is responsible for protecting future generations? And where does that responsibility lie? And we're going to dig to the bottom of that today. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming out here to be the jury, because you are the jury. And uh, there, there are large puppets, and there are a lot of uh, jokes and levity. But this is a very serious topic. And uh, we're stuck in a life and death situation together. So. It's uh, my honor to begin the trial. You and I as life, the situation is life and death. All rise. Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge of Future Generations presiding. Order. Order in the court. We are here to try the case of Tim to Christopher for the alleged crime of disrupting an oil auction in December 2008. We, the youth and future generations of the world, stand in judgment of all people of conscience, for all hold the responsibility to pass on a healthy world. The purpose of this trial is to seek truth and justice in accordance with the principles of humanity. You are invited here today to serve as a jury of peers of the defendant. Your role is to serve as the conscience of the community. As was intended by the founding fathers of this country, you shall determine the nature of justice. A jury is free to judge both the facts and the law in question and make a ruling on whatever grounds it wishes. As a supreme governing body of the United States, the jury is bound by no law above its own. Who brings the charge against Mr. De Christopher? The United States government, Your Honor. We call Tim De Christopher to take the stand. Please state your name and age. Tim De Christopher, 28 years old. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Mr. De Christopher. Did you attend the Bureau of Land Management Oil and Gas Auction on December 19th, 2008? Yes, I did. Please describe your actions at that auction. I walked into the building and was immediately asked if I was there for the auction. I said yes and was directed to a registration table. At the table, they asked if I was there to be a bidder, and again I said yes. I filled out a short form with my name, address, and whom I represented and was given bid card number seven. And did you answer those questions truthfully? Yes, I did. I gave my real name and address and said that I represented myself. Did the form make it clear that it was illegal to bid without the intent to pay? Yes, it did. And after I got registered, I went up to the auction on the fifth floor and sat there for about 30 minutes or so um, before I could no longer resist the moral imperative of interrupting the crime that was in progress. Mr. De Christopher, you can't throw around a term like that without an explanation. Please tell the court what crime was being committed. The BLM was violating several of its own laws regarding environmental impact statements and the acceptance of public comment. More importantly, the, the policy of squeezing every drop of oil out of the, the planet was destabilizing our climate and condemning our children to an unlivable future. The BLM under the Bush administration was in constant violation of Secretarial Order 3226, which was a law that went into effect in 2001 
and required the BLM and all other agencies under the Department of the Interior to weigh the impacts of climate change for any decision that they make. They were out of compliance with that law. And beyond the specific violations of certain statutes, condemning our children, failing to defend a livable future, violates a higher law, a law that we are all governed to, to defend a livable future for our children. Shall we investigate whether climate change constitutes a crime against our children? Yes! Your Honor, I'd like to call Dr. James Hansen to make that case. Dr. Hansen, can you please tell us what is at stake with the climate change that is currently occurring? What is at stake? Warming so far by about two degrees Fahrenheit over land areas. More warming is already in the pipeline, delayed only by the great inertia of the world's oceans. And climate is nearing dangerous tipping points. Elements of a perfect storm, a global cataclysm, are assembled. Debate among scientists is only about how much sea level would rise by a given date. In my opinion, if emissions follow a business-as-usual scenario, sea level rise of at least two meters is likely this century. Hundreds of millions of people would become refugees. No stable shoreline would be re-established in any time frame that humanity can conceive. Animal and plant species are already stressed by climate change. Mass extinctions of more than half the species of the planet have occurred several times before when the Earth warmed. The safe level of atmospheric carbon dioxide is no more than 350 parts per million, and it may be less. Carbon dioxide amount is already 390 parts per million and rising about two parts per million per year. And on what are these observations based? These observations are based on paleoclimate data showing how the Earth responded to past levels of greenhouse gases and on observations showing how the world is responding to, to today's carbon dioxide amount. The consequences of continued increase of greenhouse gases extend far beyond extermination of species and future sea level rise. Arid subtropical climate zones are expanding poleward. Forest fires and drying up of lakes will increase further unless carbon dioxide growth is halted and reversed. Mountain glaciers are the source of fresh water for hundreds of millions of people. They will disappear unless the growth of carbon dioxide is reversed. Dr. Hansen, uh, what do you believe is necessary for us to do at this point? We must draw down atmospheric carbon dioxide to, pre to preserve the planet we know. As I said before, a level of no more than 350 parts per million is still feasible with the help of reforestation and improved agricultural practices, but just barely. Time is running out. Unfortunately, special interests have blocked transition to our renewable energy future. If politicians remain at loggerheads, citizens must lead. We must demand a moratorium on new coal-fired power plants. We must block fossil fuel interests who aim to squeeze every last drop of oil from public lands, offshore and wilderness areas. Those last drops are no solution. They yield continuous